Well, I'll try just to show you something, some of the things I'm interested in, which have to do with corpus-based composition. I've titled this Discotheque of Babel. Um, not just because I like Borges, but also because I, I did at some point something called well, a patch, which is called the disco music of the disco of Babel, where you actually have all the music. If I just let it go, ad infinitum, well, it's just do all the music you can imagine. It'll take a gazillion times more than the age of the universe. I'll just show you what I mean. This is just stupid combinatorics, but you have all the pieces with one samples in four bits, all the pieces with two samples in four bits, and you just pick the piece you want. Okay? Most of them are noise, of course, but I assure that at some point you've got interesting things as well. So it's all here. It's, a, it's just a matter of zooming properly. Okay? Well, some of you might recognize. Uh, what's that? <clears throat> I think you have the gist of it. And it's changing just one bit at a time, one bit, uh, and, but of course that's stupid in a way. You, you would never explore something like that and the complexity of zooming in the right place is exactly the same as writing bit by bit in a buffer. But that's a metaphor for me and that's conceptual in a sense. Music is an exploration, more than an invention. Okay, so you, you, you have things, uh, you, uh, you, you can wander and explore them. I don't know if you've read Melancholy Elephants, or there are some interesting science fiction-y, uh, Borges-like or not Borges-like words where you get the same gist. And uh, the image I'd like to leave is the one of the tabula plena. Well, m most of the avant-garde started from a tabula rasa. And that was with reason. I mean, Boulez always talks about tabula rasa as being a necessity of making a clean slate from after the war and whatever happened to Europe, especially in that period. But uh, that's not how I feel today. Uh, to me, the opposite is true. I mean, I need to work with the tabula plena. I, I need to work with the past as a necessity to take it into account <coughs> as much as possible in order to uh, well, it's, it's really two, two complementary approaches, of course, the negative one and the positive one, which kind of... The idea is that you can mix them both at some point, but I want to stress the fact that the tabula plena is something I, I'm mostly interested in. Too. Also because, differently from the tabula rasa, that's, ca that's kind of an operational paradigm. I mean, there are some affordances for which the tabula itself, as you organize it, makes you explore the things and by exploring you can choose and choosing is one, probably the first compositional activity I, uh, I'd like to think about. Uh, so you have different ways you can approach a data set. You, you, you can code things, you can analyze things, you can generate things out of that, you can filter and discover <coughs> things, you can use notation, you can use morphology, you can and, and so that's plenty of that. And I think we all share some of of these attitudes to some degrees, and, um, and that's interesting. Another, another side of the story, which is a preamble, if you want, is that I, I am one half of the Bach project, which is, um, which is a project I started with Andrea Agostini 10 years ago, more or less, and it was meant to bring notation into the real-time world. Some of you already know that. Uh, so I'm sorry for restating that, but the idea is that actually you can use for scores of buffers and something on which you can operate in real time. Uh, where's the mouse? And so whatever you change, no, it's probably that one, okay? Things just get mixed up accordingly. It doesn't matter what they do, but the idea is that I can operate on a score and have some, something else work in real time. Okay, so that's another part of my interest. So data set and notation are two sides of the same story for me. I will see it a little bit later. Uh, as a starter, I would like to uh, motivate a little bit why I'm into data sets. And probably the largest project I've done uh, in terms of timing that took me uh, 
time to work on that. And in terms of data set size, it's called an experiment with time. It was an installation at first, and then it became a public uh, performance with the um, um, ensemble electronics and um, video. And uh, it, it's based, I don't know if any of you know the book by John William Dunn, it's called An Experiment with Time. It's very fascinating. It's, um, I think it's 1927, I don't remember, it's in the 20s, where actually it should be the same year of uh, Zion uh, Zeit, Zeit, uh, Zeit by uh, Heidegger. I'm not sure, but it should be around the same period. And uh, the history, well, the, the story is quite nice. He, at some point, he sees in a dream an explosion that will happen. And, and actually, the explosion happens exactly as he has seen it in the dream. And, uh, well, it's a premonition. Maybe some of you have had them. I'm not sure I have. But uh, if I had, I, I would have just said, okay, happy coincidence, weird. But what, what he started to do is to keep track meticulously and uh, mathematically, well, scientifically, or uh, pseudo-scientifically, uh, of all his dreams and compare all the images that were in his dreams with images from his own past and his own future. And after some months of calculation, he saw that more or less the same image were associated to the past than to the future, which led to think that maybe the real time, like space, <coughs> is the dream time, where time is before us exactly as you are before me right now. I mean, I can see you all of you at once. So past and future is just a matter of conscience. It's funny because it's a, it has a lot of point of common with the Bergson theory, for instance, of uh, uh, time, uh, and with other theories in that direction as well. I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, it's and, and then it becomes quite crazy. Like the last part of the essay is really crazy. Uh, I, well, if you if you're into this kind of stuff, it's a good read, I think. But I, I took the idea and I made a, a diary lasting one, one, full, one full year. And the idea was that it was some sort of a diary of everything, in a sense. Which meant that I took my hard drive, I had 3,000, I don't know, it was not that large, but it was large enough for me, 3,000 maybe, maybe 500, no, maybe 100 gigabytes of data, let's say, compressed data, and uh, um, and I decided to segment it by, um, by chord, meaning that each month had to be associated with a chord. And since there are 12 of them, I have perfect fifth going on each month to the other, and then it loops perfectly after 46 minutes. That's just a motivation behind the fact that I need, that's the first work when I, where I started to have a data set, rather large data set, segmented by chord. I did with an algorithm by Matthias Mors. Uh, with a friend uh, named uh, Mattia Bergomi. And, and that, that was it, that was the canvas in a sense. So instead of writing notes, I wrote notes that actually were chords, concatenation of chords. This E flat is not just an E flat, it's actually a concatenation of E flat major chords uh, made with some properties, okay? And the properties are specified in the note uh, metadata. And uh, then you can, I'm not sure if it works, I hope so. You can render things, and uh, once you render that, it statistically tries to find things matching what you want, and uh, see if it works. Okay. You have this kind of feeling, which is throughout the entire piece. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll make you, I'll let you hear something later, but. And of course you can tweak, you, you might say, well, I want longer grain sites here, and I want staccatos here, so let's probably make the grain sites lower, and uh, maybe, maybe the distance higher. And you get a fairly different result, I suppose. <laughs> okay, now there, there was some clip, clipping involved, I should have lowered things, and I, I had no overload protection in that case, but you, you get the gist of it, I think. And the interest is that now the data set is a canvas, and then you can do things uh, uh, associated to the scriptures, like a history of major city. From 1700-ish, way 300-ish. Okay, and so on, you get the idea. Uh, you can, well, I already played the glissando and played the... He was made 
for the peace section. This was fairly different from the others, I will explain later why. But you can do some things um, much more like alternating major and minor. Or a series of decept deceptive cadences, one after the other. You get, you, get a, you get a particular sound out of that, I think. Which was due to the fact that the data set was chosen to be, happened to be that that data set, and I like the sound I came, that came out from that. I, I'd like to play you a little bit of it, if I have time. I hope I will. I'm trying to see if it opens up. If it doesn't, there's an issue, okay. Let's say, well, even here with that. Let's take maybe Okay, I, I, I'm really not sure what. Okay, let's let's do that here. It's a story. You have to follow it through 46 minutes. You get the gist of the what it sounds like. It's an animated diary, so it's stop motion all through. There are three screens. You actually only see one at the present. to build a machine to delay time. He wants to see what's going on. And maybe here. October. So it should be E flat.
here, if we have time, maybe I'll just play a little bit more. But you get the gist of it, I think. It's a homemade video. I, I'm not a video artist, but I have fun doing things like that. It took me much more to make the video than to make the music. But I had really fun. I was almost in burnout, but I, I, it was fun. The, at the end, at the end of the day, if I think about the music, what, 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 what well, let's close that. What, what was left was a collection of our objects I had used for that. Concatenations in various ways. And some of them were raw material, of course. I, could not, I couldn't have used them by themselves. Some of them, to me, look, looked much more autonomous. For instance, I still like the glissando. I think it's uh, autonomous in a sense. It's an object, you can take it and, uh, and you can do whatever you want. And I, from that, I try, I try to explore more this idea of autonomous concatenation of objects. I, I, already made, uh, I already played to, for you some of them yesterday. Well, the glissando, I won't play that again. Well, I, I'll play the clapping one if you're up for it. But that's that's the gist of it. What, I, I'm, I'm in, what, what, what am I interested in? In the fact that I have a large collection of things, I only take the portion I'm, I'm interested in. The parameter is simple in a way, and the descriptor is unique. It's just a tempo going down, for instance. You already heard uh, yesterday the, the one called Money Notes. So, well, I'll just play the beginning. But... The one I already played. So the money notes are just this high pitched note that singer used to sing to sell more CDs, I suppose. I'm not an expert in the field, so they're called money notes. Um, I'd like to play some more of them if you're not too tired <coughs> for that. One is called Goodbye. Goodbye. Why don't I have a... Goodbye. Goodbye. Okay, that's, that's good. Bye. Well, you get the gist again. It could go on forever, but it doesn't. Uh, oh yeah, it's too black. Just the last one, sorry. Good night. Since that time. Oh. Mm -hmm.
Okay, on one side, it could have gone on forever. To me, those are journeys in a way. So it's like, you all know probably the Gute Nacht uh, Lied, and uh, it's actually a journey, it's a uh, winter ride. And uh, to me, each time I hear, it's not about sound quality, as you, as you Scene. It's a, nothing to do with that. Most of what I do is not about sound quality, and um, I'm not particularly f interested in that. That's not the main uh, aspect. But it's about creating the connection between things. And whenever I see here each one of them, it makes me a journey between what that pianist could have done, what that other one was thinking when he was playing that other piano. And, and I'm, I'm with the stream, in a sense, and I like, I like this idea of uh, the, these objects being trajectories in, in some sort of space, uh, on a map. And um, I don't know what they are, in a sense. They're experiments to me. Uh, sometimes, well, I, sometimes they're humorous, I mean, maybe some of them can be funny, I hope, maybe not. It's, it's well, I don't know. We, we might, I, I go a, a bit far, f faster on that. Um, I don't know what the duration should be. I pick something, but it could be forever. It could be just 10 seconds. Uh, but these are, in a sense, both objects and material for something else. I'll give you just a, uh, an example. The same concatenation you've heard is in a more structured piece for voice and electronics. I, I played a little bit yesterday. It will be played in... Uh, um, this fall, so this is a sort of a preview of a maquette, but you get the gist, you, you can hear the piano behind backwards, I think.
okay, the ventilation is not in the piece. The mix is quite bad, it will be performed live, this is still a maquette, but I think you get the gist of it. And there were at least two of the concatenations here, not just the piano pattern, but also the uh, A at the end, all the people who sing the same note, it's just stretched a lot, but they were all there. Um, so I'm, I'm still trying to find a way where to preserve the objects in their integrity. I see a pure composition, the act of choosing and putting together, you know, in the original sense of the word. And to using them in a larger context, the piece is about identity, identity. Which is the reason why I'm interested in, compos in uh, corporate composition in the first place. I mean, who are we? Who am I with respect to anything that's going on? Can I, can I just put boundaries to me? No, of course not. I mean, I, I'm, in a sense, I'm a, a bit of you and you're a bit of me. Uh, every exchange we have makes it much more clearer and so on. And uh, the data set I've used except for those concatenations is the AGP project. Some of you may know it. It's the avant-garde project, some vinyls being digitalized. Uh, I, I have a lot of reference of artists alike doing similar things. The first one is Christian Markley. Uh, if some of you have, if any of you has in the clock, you, you do? Okay. Well, that's, that's when I say, that, uh, uh, before I said, a masterpiece could be as easy, as simple as a recipe. That's what I meant. Okay. And that's in a, uh, that's in a way something I would like to achieve. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen the clock, the clock is an installation with a screen where snippets of, from the history of film, uh, of movies, are taken, but only where clocks are displayed. And they are mounted to be always in real time with the, uh, with the viewer. So actually, you go there at 3 o'clock, you have a 3 o'clock, well, no, we're not at midday, but if we had been a midday, we'd see that, midday 5 and so on. It's always in real time. It's an eerie experience. It's a, actually, it's an eerie experience, but it's, it's painfully, painfully vivid and uh, important to me, I'd say. There are many more things like that I would like to cite. I just, just one, which is less known, I think, but it's A History of the Sky by Ken Murphy. It's just a guy who put a camera up from his roof, <coughs> and uh, each one of the cell is one day in the year, and it just goes throughout the day. So this is summer, probably, because uh, the sun is already up. That's winter, sun is still down. And little by little, it comes up. You have the, it lasts, I think, five minutes. It compressed in five minutes. But you have one day, one year of sky just in front of you. That's, what I'm, that's something I, that inspired me to some extent, thinking about time and space again. It's a sort of transformation of time and space. Now time becomes space, in a sense. And, and, uh, and I like that. It's very poetic, I think. With, very, with, with almost nothing, you do something that tells something. And uh, those are, to me, things I think about a lot. And I'd like to get to this kind of simplicity at a certain point. Let's, let's get a bit more into the hood, maybe, under the hood, which might be more or less challenging. I'll, I'll just take one example, then I'll get under the real hood. This is the false hood. Why I, you'll discover why I say that. Uh, that's a question I have for you. Uh, that's a question I pose myself. How do I build a data set of vocabulary sounding? I really didn't know how to do that. Okay, so at first I say, well, let's try to analyze the thing, take the F0 and tracks when it lies. But then, of course, it doesn't work, because uh, how do you distinguish between a voice and an instrument of glissando? And again, maybe a vocal glissando is a, against a steady harmonic, harmony, so it's not sliding the F0, it, it doesn't take the right F0, so you've got plenty of error, you have maybe 5% of uh, good detection and a lot of things to throw away. It doesn't work. So you, you say, well, Classifying things is something a neural network is very fit to do. But then again, if you, if you have to take a neural network to do that, you have to give examples. And you don't have them. If you had them, you, you'd, have, you'd solve your problem in the first place. So you might say, well, what if I design the example artificially? What if I mix a real voice and put it under something else, and then I force it to detect as a voice, and I flag it as a glissando, and, and little by little you spend days, 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 and nothing works. I mean, you, you don't improve things you do. 
And then you say, well, let's start from scratch. Let's take the partial analysis and let's try to vectorize it and see whether we can infer something from the curves in a sort of vector analysis and slope analysis. And you do that and you get to somewhere, but you still have almost nothing. And one month has passed and you're back to point zero. You have learned a lot and that's <coughs> fine, but you're back to square zero. The other way of doing that is to ask your friends if they know any vocabulary sounder. <laughs> okay? And then you ask your friends to ask their friends if they know any vocabulary sounder. And in five days you, you collect a hundred, two hundred blissandi. That might be enough. You know, I, I think you've, born, you've, been, you've been all in this position. What I'm saying is that there's always a tension between should I code that or should I find another way of getting that? And music should come always first. In this case, I didn't want to spend five months in detecting glissandi. I just spent one. It didn't work. That was a bad idea. So I just asked my friends. It was done in, like, uh, in, in five days. And actually what happens is that it's very nice because from time to time I discover another glissandi or someone else coming to me and say, oh, sorry, I didn't tell you, but there's this one as well. And I change it. And so the piece is changing over time. Uh, every, every time I make a new version and it's going to be a piece of pieces in a sense. But it was just to share, of course this doesn't work when you have a lot of material to work with. I mean, you couldn't do the same thing on more large corpus or more thorough uh, corpus. Which means that what I usually do, well that's, that's what I do, it's not a dogma, of course, it's just what I usually do, is to have as fast as possible descriptors, calculation, so in shell, uh, probably command line mostly, and uh, I try to optimize things. Either I code them myself, or I use a lot of things. The one you see here uh, are the best one that fit my need. It doesn't it doesn't mean that it may fit your need. And then I bring all in Max, and I do all the interface stuff in Max, uh, which involves uh, exploring, writing, and and so on. Which I I, I just show you a little bit of examples on that. Uh, for instance. Um, I'm sorry, this overlaps a, little, uh, a lot with what Hans showed and it, takes, it might take a little bit of time to load because I haven't loaded and they are not attached to the hard drive, they are always charged in memory so at some point it will take a little time to load some of the slides. But, um, for instance here I have a rather small data set of 40,000 fragments. Uh, but I can select from them according to any criteria. It's basically what, uh, what Hans has already shown, so I won't get too much into details, but I can say, for instance, I want uh, piano sounds from this collection with this chord, at least two beats, lasting at least one second, when we can, we can maybe loosen a little bit the BPM request, let's say until 95 or something. Or Okay, or let's leave it as it is and let's loosen the game request. And you get some sort of matches, okay? This is the number of matches you get, or loosen the centroid request. Let's say I want things with a higher centroid than that. Okay, I get more. And uh, then you can concatenate it. You have just an algorithm to do that. You can sort them, you can decide what pattern to use. It's not that interesting, but uh, the final step would be just to have a score of options that you can, well, it's not maybe gonna play with it, but that's right. Okay, there's some noise in that, but you get, you get the idea. You can take all the, all the data sets, feel to them by, or if we, I'm not sure if I have all the chords in this data set, I probably don't. <laughs> Let's try to see, because I made a little one to work with for today. Yeah, I don't have C major. Let's, like, let's see if we get G. I'm not sure. No, maybe I only put C in the data set. Well, it doesn't matter. But, and then you can explore it in different ways. Uh, one has already been shown by... Where, okay, it's here. By, uh, by Hans was the X, Y coordinate system. We are all used to that. I don't know why I called data.catart. This is part of the library which has been spawned by Bach, which is called, the, the library is called Data. It contains an object data.base that is an SQL interface. 
and it contains some objects that are interface. Well, well, it's an SQL interface, but it's not not an interface object. It's uh, just an interface for the. And then you have actual UI to, to deal with that. And uh, for instance, these are organized according to the relative weights with respect to some descriptors, like how triplety they are, how funky they are. I don't know. You can you can have your own things. Uh, just to give you a glimpse of some happy, fun stuff you can do with that. You can have Beatles in C, you just only take Beatles stuff once per song. Beat a line, so you have a sort of... If there are some Beatles fan, we'll uh, recognize most of the songs, or you can just take triplicate stuff, as I said. So this is just filtering out what's sweet. Everything. That's Beethoven and... You, you get the gist again. And uh, this is the kind of things you can do by concatenating and filtering and concatenating. I'll give you another couple of examples. This one might also take a little bit to load if I initialize properly. Let's try to see. This is a data that another... This is essentially the data that I've used for an experiment with time. This is probably the only time where I've been performing live things. And as I said, I'm not a performer, I'm not an improviser, uh, even less an improviser, I'd say. So no, not a performer, not an improviser. I just jumped into that. It was a way of making some sort of a sound, um, I would say sound uh, murales or sound uh, paintings with a large canvas, just, uh, just with, uh, by choosing and filtering Via, via interface, that's very easy. What, what happens is that, let's take, uh, well, let's take this one which is Mark Bello with a question mark, so I'm not sure if it's Bello Commission or not. Uh, okay, it's only playing, I think, things at 90 BPM, plus minus something, well, let, let's reduce that. Within that bass chord, so this is the bass note she's choosing, and uh, these are the allowed chords to be chosen from. So it's just a sequence of bangs that queries all the time a specific amount of information from the dataset and paint the large picture of a. Okay, and, and things can go on. Of course, you can you can have a you can go on with BPM. You can only take high and try stuff. Very soft stuff. Well, you get the gist again. This was used to build some sort of big glissando in resale like glissando that just goes on for 20 minutes and brings to a. Uh, well, let's, add, let's add more for different. Sorry? Base. At what rate are you querying your database? Uh, the one you, well, uh, you don't see it. It's, it's, uh, it's actually that, that rate. This is the rate at which I query. And this is referred to the BPM. So in this case, it would be, I query three samples each uh, quarter at 
162 BPM. So it's not that fast, but I could go as, I think I could go as fast as this one with uh, 180 BPM. So it means roughly 12 times per second to have something that is processed because there's a lot going on. And uh, it's not just the querying, it's the making of it and that takes a lot of uh, time and effort. But that's, that's another way of seeing it. Um, the workspace I've been using for, um, for uh, this is the game, is a different one. I just show you, but it's very similar. I would say it's mostly the same thing over and over again. In this case, I have other kinds of data sets, the one you see at right. And whenever I click on some of them, I can load them. Let's say I want to load, I don't know, the Pierre Lumière or the Russia. And some of them are bigger than others. Okay, and whenever I load them, I have all the instruments coming here. And I can, again, I can filter by instruments, by chord. That's essentially what I do, like searching these ones or these ones. Okay, so I'm filtering and it's just making, uh, it's just a sequence of queries. So, and, and then I search solution with exactly two nodes. Let's see. <clears throat> so I have a few of them, not very much. Let's see if that works. It's not super precise because the analysis is messy. Uh, most analysis works fine on pop and rock. It works very bad on classical, but mostly contemporary music uh, just makes it throw up, from my experience at least. So, okay, so though this is the moment I have analyzed in that split second. It has those two nodes, so I can retrieve them and build. That's essentially how I build uh, the. Um, the composition for uh, this is the game. Uh, those interfaces are part of a project named Data, which is much larger than that. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we have seen a little bit of the data set uh, tools, but it contains a lot of other uh, interfaces, non-standard interfaces like physical model things where actually planets orbit around stars and play, and play stuff by just by gravitational things, or swarm intelligence models, or um, bouncing chambers, things like that. And you, you see, well, uh, that's uh, kaleidoscopes, uh, cellular automata. Okay. All of those things inform the, the, are present in this library, which is called Tab Data Library. And it's made essentially by UI, so it's some sort of things you can play with and then record, ideally. And, uh, uh, and it's made to explore music more than invent it. Again, it's always the same uh, paradigm. As far as data sets are concerned, uh, maybe I'll skip over this. I think you are all familiar with the fact that you can represent things like that, unless there's some issue with that. You can organize things, you can, uh, well, you can record things, uh, Ansel already showed you that you can do that, you can filter that, and so on. I mean, this is all something you should already know. Uh, the next slide is something which my answer to one of your questions, and I think it takes a little while to load. But another way of showing a data set is not just by Cartesian coordinates, but by distances between points. Let's assume I don't know what is a coordinate of a point, but I know that two points are similar or different with respect to some idea. So in this case, I have a, a data set of chords, and they are organized by a similarity measure I divide, it's a sort of edit distance, adding nodes, removing nodes, and how far are nodes. And uh, it's a graph, actually. You can see it as a graph. And uh, you can uh, say that two nodes are connected if their distance is below that. You can choose a starting node, you can navigate. And you have a sequence of chords bringing you from A to B if you want, by step by step, by mark of like navigation of a graph, but that's another way of seeing that, and that's multidimensional scaling, by the way, on, uh, on two dimensions. Another way, another patch I would like to propose to you, just to show you some of the things I do, I am part of a community named Nothing, which is a, a collective of composers in Italy. Uh, we wrote one piece together last year, a long 40-minute piece, and uh, for the last section we didn't know what to do, so we decided to write each one of us 50 little pieces, and then gather all of them together and organize and make a montage out of them. And montage modified, like I, I could take the score and stretch it, uh, time start. We had a sequence of operations we could perform. But all the operations are 
actually embedded in this metascore. Each one of those nodes is actually one of these grains. And each one of these grains is a score. Could be acoustical, could be instrumental, could be, uh, could be electronical, could be both. And so when you render them, you actually have the actual score. That's not the definitive, that was our starting point. But it was a good starting point, in a sense, because from there, but the beginning remained exactly the same, but then we modified it a little by little. But to get a starting point, we wanted to write things together, and that was an, a, a sort of search space for us to dive into. And you could do some more things. You, you could put an LCD over that, draw lines, and reproduce the line with different, and, well, you, you, all, all the things you can do with, uh, I mean, path and K and Ns and things like that. And in this case, this is an actual metascore, meaning that's a score of scores. Each one of the nodes actually contains a score. Um, another similar example, not, yet, not identical, but similar, is for another piece I've been writing, uh, where actually a data set is not a data set I've been choosing, but a data set I've been generating with a large number of automatic orchestration of a single sound. That's not new. I mean, uh, if, you, if you know uh, Speakings by Jonathan Harvey, there is a portion where there's a uh, mantra sung and uh, always retranscribed with different orchestration. I wanted to explore the same thing in a way, but uh, with a different, very different sound. So the sound is this one. So it's quite relaxing. And, and, and I've got a lot of orchestration organized by centroid and complexity in a sense. Okay, you can explore them. I have, I have the scores, you don't see them, but you do. And for each one of, and then I have a rhythmic pattern I chose. And for each one of the notes in the pattern, I just choose the I just choose the trajectory I want for my whole well orchestration number to go on from A to B or from the beginning and the end, and so you get something like that. It's just, just to give you a gist. Okay, well. Maybe let's bounce it so you see that each one of them is actually a score. <clears throat> and then you get the actual score with the orchestral portion. And again, when, when it, it's, I just overposed some ever-changing scales in the background. That's, well, that's the fourth portion of a piece for orchestra I've been writing, but that's just to say, a data set could be a lot of things to me, not just uh, sounds, could be scores, could be orchestration, which is between the two, if you want. Could be words, could be images, could be... A, but that's essentially, well, that's for all of us like that. Uh, I'm not here to try to pretend to teach anything. I'm just here to pretend to show you what I do and see whether we can have a discussion about that, if that fits any of uh, your... Uh, um, and, and to pose you and, and to give some question. The other question I have with respect to anything I've said, and with respect to notation especially. Because as you said, I'm fond of notation. To me, that's the piece. If I didn't have the notation, I couldn't have written any of that. And uh, notation is a travel, well, it's, to me, makes me traveling, in a sense that as we usually think about notation in computer environments, that's not how I think about notation or music in a general sense. I never write things by putting pitches and then uh, velocities and then durations, okay. That's, that's fine, I mean, it's a Cartesian way to write music, to distinguish orthogonal parameters. Uh, it makes science out of music. We've, we've been using that for ages and it works very well. But it's a bit reductive if you think about a musical phenomenon in a more general sense. So that's something I've been thinking a little bit about in the late, uh, uh, in, in the late years, I, I'd say in the late months at least. 
how can I handle, have a handle and a more entangled representation of music? Uh, so where everything is bundled in a sense. Okay. Ta, 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 ta. <coughs> okay. And uh, I might say the same thing for the melody. I'm not sure that many would say that this melody is a nice melody or that this harmony is a particularly nice harmony. And those are the ratings given by pro professional musicians when Sadai, which is a musicologist, made this product. Well, actually, asked people to have these products. But some of you might already recognize it. I'm not sure. Uh, uh, well, most of you should have heard. Okay. Well, it's cheating in a sense, because of course there's much more than that that goes on. But the idea is there. I mean, for instance, Sadai doesn't account for harmonic rhythm or things like that, but the, the, the thing stays there. We cannot reduce things to a separate parameters. We should have a more entangled representation of things, otherwise we missed, we missed something. And uh, I don't have answers, I have two paths. The first path is, again, grain-based representation. So we can, it's exactly as we have grain-based, like a, a Gabor base or, you know what I mean, representation of audio, we might have grain-based representation of music. We might, I mean, I granulate scores all the time, but the issue is that resynthesis is difficult. If I do a piece for flute, what do I do with the... Well, it's hard to take a grain and plug it into the other. It's already difficult for audio, but you can get by with techniques, I mean, most of the time I do crossfading and that works, I, sh I shouldn't say that too loud, but I cannot crossfade to scores without entering into dangerous uh, portion of the territory. So I, I, I really don't know where to go from that. And I'd like to share a little bit of my experience with machine learning since we have spoken about that so much in the last few days. I, have not, I don't have a huge experience with that. I'm interested in it because it provides non-Cartesian representation of music because it provides representation which are very different from frequency and pitch and, and so on. Maybe the frequency is always there, because it, it learns it in a sense at the first stages of the process. But the other one is kind of far apart. Um, again, I'm not an expert, but I've, I've been using it in a specific project named La Fabrique de Monstre. It was uh, meant to be used in a theatrical project. I don't think the use in the theatrical project went well, but I, there's a SoundCloud album which I like. It's an album of generative music. I made it with uh, uh, Robin Meyer. Some of you might know him at uh, IRCAM. And uh, the idea was very basic. Well, that's the same idea. Well, it, it's the base of WaveNet. And so being able <coughs> to build a machine. Well, like, uh, does any of you know Le Chateau de Carpath? It's a book by Verne where actually the main character tried to build the voice of the lover who is lost by electricity. And that's the idea behind that. Just by using electricity or learning by electricity, how can we voltage things? How can we rebuild the voice of someone? And hence the presence of someone. So the monster could be the music. And uh, the idea uh, was to try to... Um, see, yeah? to match four properties that this machine should have, at least for me. It should, it should be generative. In a sense, I, I should be able to... I, I wanted to be able to tell the machine, go and speak for three hours, go and speak for two minutes, not just speak for a little bit at a time. It should be agnostic. It should have no prior knowledge whatsoever about what a note is, what a, uh, what a chord is, what harmony is, what form is. Okay, so as agnostic as possible. It should be coherent. I didn't want just jumble, mumbo jumbo of things mush, mish mush together, which I do all the time, but I didn't want in this case. And it should be in some sense original. That's the hardest one to catch, which means I didn't want to reproduce portion of sounds I had in the data set, in the training uh, data set. Uh, in the end, we, we experienced with a lot of models, uh, WaveNet included, some, uh, uh, of course, we are not Google unfortunately, so we didn't have access to all the technology, so we scaled it down to low resolution, low, exactly. all the low thing we could use, we, we load it down, so, um, so for instance, uh, again, that it's not a matter of high quality sound, it will never be, not in this case, it will be maybe be in some years. We chose sample RNN, which is an unconditioned uh, uh, multi-layer network, some of you may know it, and uh, I'd like to share with you just some results we had. 
they're not maybe they're not interest per se because Google does much much more interesting thing. But I think they're interesting in the in the spirit of apprentice of uh, learning things. How how these things learn, which was what are interesting in not really reproduce something but see how it can be learned. Okay, and. Uh, this is a data set of Schubert leader. That's the data set we used it in the end. Okay, and at the beginning, what we did was just feeding the machine with a lot of, I don't know, probably ten hours of Schubert leader with the same people singing. And uh, um, at the beginning, and after it already, well, at some specific points, you ask to generate things to see how things go on. At the beginning, it just noise essentially. But as you go on with the epochs. Some things start to emerge. The vowel E, maybe. Well, I go quite fast to that. A. Okay, it's, it's like there's a voice somewhere that this. <laughs> It's coming out little by little, and that was kind of interesting. At some point, I don't know if that's one or the last one. At some point, the voice started to say ish. <laughs> to me, that was amazing. <laughs> At some point, this machine started to say ish. It's the birth of a culture. <laughs> Metaphorically, I liked it very much. But you get the point. It's not about it's not about high quality sound. That's as, that's as far as we could get with this data set. Okay, these kind of things. But again, uh, then we tested other data sets, and they went they went very well, I think, or at least better. You can hear maybe a choir. It's a late medieval. But except for the mistakes, you'd say, well, I'd say if it was higher quality and so on, it could be plausible in a way. And I, I, if you can hear the mistake one more, listen here, there's a mistake. Pay attention to that. That the mistake was reverberated. Of course, this only means that the machine, at some level, has understood that the original thing has reverb. And so, at some point in the neural network, very deep, there would be some neuron firing when the reverb is active or something like that. What I mean is that the machine has learned what a reverb is just by giving the reserve, reverb to, to her, so to it. It's synthesizing the entire sound? It's synthesized sample by sample. You, 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 it's exactly WaveNet. Is okay? WaveNet? Oh. Well, you, you, I, I think it's clear what I'm. Is it clear what I'm doing? I'm feeding sample by sample, and at some point I'm just saying, do sample by sample predictions, and that's what it does. But this is a recording method, right? This uh, we fed. I fed six hours of recording. But it's recording, so maybe the, the decay of the river could be that. It's actually the, the memory of the network that's decaying. No, because in other, in other data sets where there's no reverb, there's no decay. No, no, the, the, the reverb is actually connected with the same, if you listen to it closely, it's the same reverb. It's like if someone fired something in that church. What? Yeah, that's true. I think my issue is, yeah, it has learned a model that will create perception reverb, but the model has no concepts. Of, of course, but what is a concept? Okay. Exactly. If you were gonna, if you were gonna go down that path, I did, it's it's a far road. What I, I'm only saying that in this layer, <coughs> neural network layer, at some point, there are neurons firing for reverbs. That's all I'm saying. Uh, in, in <laughs> that's that's where I, that's, uh, I say there's not neurons firing. I think there for is. For reverb. I think for this kind of reverb, I'm not well. 
I think um, um, if I fed two would different we things, discriminate between different neurons that are firing for different things that we can conceptually similar, conceptually separate. Is what I'm disagreeing with. The result of the network as a whole, and, and I don't definitely know the answer. But the result of the network as a whole is that there is a, that we get these kind of reverb characteristics. Okay, I see. I see what you I see what you mean. I am not making you hear other examples, and, but this is this was a data set with only choir, only this kind of reverberant yeah, sound. Yeah. Okay, but what, you're right. There's no. I, I've said it wrong. There's no neuron firing because everything has reverb here, so the network has have been trained to reproduce this kind of reverb. What I mean is that since the network can do that, if we gave a different data set, I'm probably positive that at some point there will be a neuron firing for the reverb. If we give something which has the reverb and something which has not the reverb, it's an incredibly tight pattern to match. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It's, it's a pattern matcher, this kind of thing. And it, it will fire at some point, I think, but I might be wrong. One question about sound quality, so you said it's very low. Um, if you would give it a pristine collection of sounds, would you get high quality sound output? It's just a matter of computing power. We didn't have enough memory, GPU memory to work with uh, higher quality sounds, and uh, we didn't have enough time to work with higher quality sound. But maybe there's also a bandwidth thing, like in terms of information. Could be. The, the last two octaves, we hear as quality, but in terms of information, by, by opposition to the vocality of that choir and the pitch material and the reverb, that's all where the all the human models of listening that we have are overlapping. But even the transients and the attacks and everything that I've heard has it's very similar. Like it sounds like convolution. You know, when you take like one impulse of a sound that doesn't have. I do it all the time. I use impulse yeah. response technology. I take yeah. not even impulse, maybe a whole song, and impose a that song impulse onto another impulse that doesn't have anything to do with it. And you listen to the outcome. You get this like strange mixture of frequencies, of harmonies, and things that are. It yeah, has to do with the fact there's no top. You cannot multiply by something you don't have. So no, I'm right. You multiply it's, by zero. It, exactly. But Guy, to me, some sorry very to, similar to some of the things of my experimentations with. It like could be. Pulse, I, 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 will, I will let you hear some other things, because given that you're interested. But yeah. the point for me is not just uh, it's not quality in itself, it's memory. And that's where this thing <laughs> failed for the moment, because the memory of the network, the recurrent uh, number of uh, uh, back propagation steps, is limited in, in, I don't know, maybe half a second. It's not much. It means that it's someone that doesn't remember what he did or he or she did one second before. Okay, that's not, I mean, we all remember what we did one second before and we have a, well, pretty much if I, if I play a C and then I play a D, I know that I played a C in a sense. And they don't. And, and still they do this kind of, and yeah. that's why the form is so convolutional to me. This is also yeah. to do with the Maybe There's no the macro form. You can do the same thing with um, with a Markov chain, and if the data set is small, the order can be smaller than it appears to be generating. Yeah. Because what happens is that there's only a certain sequence that can come out, uh, and that's where temperature order. comes in. By the way, but yeah, you could do that, Alex. But macro chain on this kind of number of states is impossible. No, I'm not. I'm just suggesting that sometimes these things where we appear to have a sort of, sort of short duration of memory and it appears like more can also relate to the data. Can, can I let you hear something else before <laughs> answering <laughs> more questions? <laughs> no, that's not an orchestra. Well, I, I won't play you that no noise, but you can imagine what happens. Speech. That's interesting because you see here, it has no memory. It's a sort of gram no. Okay. And so you can mix things together and generate audio books. <laughs> I had a lot of fun in making audio books. Great. And uh, these, these examples to me is the best I could find. In, it's a soprano in orchestra. If I, well, you know that's uh, made up, but it could be a distorted CD to me. That's 
exactly as it came out from the machine. Okay? And this to me was really astonishing. When I heard that, I said, okay, I can do fake Strauss. <laughs> okay. What is it for? Maybe Klaps, but no, Klaps doesn't want Strauss probably, but you see the point. And at that point, of course, I'm not sure I will be able to distinguish between something that's not now, but in 20 years time, between, I know I have 12 minutes. I, I, oh, okay, later, later. How many input neurons do you use? <laughs> okay, we, we, can, we, can, we can do that later. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, we can. And uh, I'll just share with you the, this matter, how I did this, because it comes back to many things you have said uh, previously, with this, which is, you don't want to listen to too many things, you get tired. Actually, the way we did that is to have the machine construct months of music. And then listen to them, more or less. <laughs> okay. Do you have examples of anything, just like rhythms, like mixtures of different rhythms and percussion, and drums. I haven't tried drums, but yes, yeah, the, the thing awesome. we do, I, we have tried rock with yeah. drums. Well, something with no terminal quality at all, just rhythms. And the the thing with rhythm is that extremely based on memory. Yeah. So either it's a very fast rhythm and it can pick it up, <laughs> or if it's something going sho, sto, stu. Yeah. Sure. It's not going to pick it up because it's a memory. The memory is too short for it to understand that this leads to that, yeah, leads to that. Okay. This was it was three years ago. Probably you're going to be able to do that now at Google in a blink of an eye. I mean, uh, yeah. in a blink of an eye. I'm not saying this is not the state of the art. This is something we have been exploring some years ago. Now it's going to be easier than that, and probably you're going to do it with a higher quality and so on. But for instance, just to give you an idea, uh, let's take the Schubert leader. Those are all the generation of Schubert leader. There's quite a lot of them. Not all of them are interesting. Actually, a small percentage of them are interesting. And the task is to listen to them and to choose them. You get tired, you stop, you quit. You get up the next day, you listen, you choose them. It's a sort of zen feeling towards composition. You go into a garden and you say, oh, there are a lot of flowers, but that's my flower, and that's my flower. And you take the time to choose the flower one by one. And uh, it comes back to thinking about composition as choosing from a set of things. And uh, uh, two, two interesting points to me are brought up by that. The first one, well, of course it reminds of a lot of things that you, some of the things you have all been doing, some of the things that David Cope has been doing, uh, it, it all comes from somewhere, of course. I'm not saying that it comes from nothing. But the first thing I like is that it questions the role of the author. You, you, you never know who, did, who does what. And that question copyrights, and that question a lot of things I like to be questioned. Okay? And we can get into that maybe later if some of you want to speak about that. And the other thing I've already spoken a little bit about that. To me, this is a kind of synthesis. In this project, it was unconditioned. It meant we just told the machine to speak. But you can very light condition the generation to some parameters, harmonical, rhythmical, textural, uh, whatever thing you want to add uh, to the learning process. And then you have an actual synthesis tool, which makes synthesis, not sampling. And that's, that's where the, the thing synthesis and sampling are going to merge comes from a little bit. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, I think I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to... No. Similarity of lateral representation. I just skip. Sorry. I, I just want to make a little bit of a coda and saying... I, I mentioned at the beginning that I liked the duality between electroacoustic and acoustic music, but I, I really tried to cross the bridges in some sense. And I will just propose you some way of trying to cross the bridges. They are stupid ways. But I want you to propose them anyway. Maybe they spawn something else. What, what I have been doing for the last years is to write acoustic music based on electronic music, to try to have the same feeling, either orchestrating or and, the, and vice versa. But for instance, uh, some pieces for orchestra are done by. Well, let's take it maybe from. Well, I don't have time to show you uh, to play. Well, maybe a little bit. That's an electronic piece. And that's the acoustic one. No, it's later, sorry. So it's here. <laughs> Another moment of white. 
you see the point, I'm not going to play more than that, but most of the thing I've been doing lately is to try to also feel with the two worlds and see whether things make sense in a sort of a homomorphism of things, of I don't know what, but something should be preserved. And uh, so the general workflow, even for acoustic music, is to generate material in Max, <coughs> mount it somewhere in a DAU, whatever, and then a step of orchestration. That's not something I do all the time, but it's most of the time. Then each piece is a bit, a bit different. Sometimes you have two pieces, the electronic one and the acoustic one. Okay, like the one I've shown you. Sometimes it's just one piece, and, uh, and, you, and the electronics is, is simply a maquette. Okay, something you can... That's... It's not an ele electronics piece, it's just a maquette I've been fiddling around. To be able to orchestrate it, for instance. I show just a little bit of other way around. So, how to bring electronic into other 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 ways of bringing electronic into symbolic? There are some gesture I do all the time, like uh, speeding up or slowing down in uh, in samples that I've never done in scores. Why not? But you you should be able to do the same thing. Okay. So I've, that that's one thing you can do. You can do processes where actually we say like accelerando, rallentando that has a counterpoint on score, of course. You can do the same thing going on in scores uh, as well. Uh, granulation, we've already spoken about that, but you can take a score and granulate it, like, like, like you would with a buffer. Okay. Okay, all of this is basic, of, of course. I, I'm not showing you anything fancy, but uh, time warp operation, something you do on buffers or music all the time, you can do that on scores, why not? Just a matter of running time, the accelerandi, and maybe quant quantization, a proper quantization. Uh, is that something else? Uh, you can take advantage, well, that's, that's, that's a way, for instance, why is, inter why is interactivity important for me? Uh, what, if you had, what if I had to build a canon? That's a stupid idea, again. But if I had to build a canon, I could have a voice and the entrances of the canon transposed by the amount I wanted to transpose with a duration matching a stretch factor. And what's interesting is that you can actually move them. And what happens is that you actually can say, well, now that note should be here. Yeah, but to be there, I might stretch it a little bit. So the other one is there. And you kind of see the results all the way and, and you can build something by having all of the time interactively uh, um, under your uh, eyes, whatever, whatever is important for you. And that's about it. Uh, I swear, I hope I didn't bore you. Maybe I bore you a little bit with the first part. If, if some of you has questions, I'd be happy to answer or remarks. Nothing is it's far from perfect. I, I have so many things to ask you about most of the things you do, so I'll do that maybe at dinner. I've already done that for a couple of you. Maybe if it's not so much a question, but a kind of comment, like I really find all the quotation stuff and, and like the multi-dimensional, I mean like temporally multi-dimensional navigating of like culture, really, really interesting. And then for me, like when here I hear the, the mixed renderings of that, like one of the earlier- You, you mean the like, piece, the actual- yeah, yeah, the actual piece, I guess in this sense. For me, when when you have something that's um, symbolic, and I don't mean notationally symbolic. Yeah, I, mean, I, like, I, yeah I, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, what it then becomes an actual piece that becomes flat, like the symbol collapses and it becomes an actual piece, which for me then loses the the, depth. the cultural context. Yeah, I understand. And so, is that are you is that okay? Like, do you do, like how do you how do you deal with that? That's a hard answer. It's something I feel profoundly. That's the reason why I explore the two things together. On one side, I know that. 
I've, I've been grown up in, a, in an environment where the actually it's, the piece is much more interesting than the object uh, itself, as I propose. Mm. And whenever I speak with friends, for instance, I have the exact opposite, opposite reaction uh, with respect to the one you gave to me. Right. But I'm, I'm kind of akin to yeah. what you're saying. Uh, don't get me wrong, but whenever I talk with um, close friends of mine or people who, who, composer whom, with whom I collaborate, they're always trying to push me into making music out of that. That's not yeah. music, that's <laughs> conceptual art. Yeah. I like the two things, honestly. I do think that there, the depth is not lost, in a way. It's under the hood. You have to search for that. Exactly like if you hear a lead by uh, Stefano Gervasoni, you're not going to get the lyrics. You're not going to get the text. But if you know the text, it gets deeper. Uh, I, I, I have the feeling that, uh, uh, yes, I like the raw object because it's raw and it makes sense to be raw and, and I like it to be that way. But I also am profoundly into a musical thinking where the form is different than the one where you trace a line and that's it. Uh, I'm torn apart. Mm -hmm. I, I have no answer. I like the two. Sorry. One more comment before. Yes, I'm I would just um, comment on this. I think what might be happening to my perception also in those examples is that they are very unidimensional and they have, they set up an expectation from the get go which at the end gets fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And I always think about if my grandmother would tell me a week before Christmas, oh, and by the way, next week is Christmas and you get a bicycle and I'm getting the bicycle, <clears throat> it's, it's not such a nice gift, you know? So <laughs> You mean in the raw, in the raw yeah. concatenations? Yeah, but um, so I think if there was the possibility of a twist, something unexpected happening, then I think it would renew our interest in them just saying, okay, it fulfills this premise. Well, on that, I'm, I, I, I disagree. I, I, I like. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I like the two sides. I like the conceptual side where there's no tweak, and that's just the line. And I like the music, more musical word where I can make out of that something I want, but I don't want to tweak it a little bit. I, I don't. I...